Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, we'll get you a seat in just a minute. First thing I want to say is thank you to the families for coming today. It's very nice to have you here. I love seeing babies and all that stuff. And the world that Darlene and I live in, growing up children and all that, it's good to see the future all around us. So we're going to do a re-enlistment right off the bat here. And uh, I'll go ahead and give the oath if uh, you're okay with that or do you have anything before that? Yes, sir. Okay. And since he's the chaplain, we'll do whatever he says because uh, he reports to a higher cause than I even I do. All right. You all ready to join our Navy again? Some of you have been discharged, haven't you already? So we better hurry up and get this going. Okay. So uh, I'm going to kind of stand at the side so I don't have my back to the eye. Actually, I'll go right over here. You all can still see me. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, then state your name. Do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. And I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the officers appointed over me in accordance with regulations and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. So help me God. Okay, welcome back and thank you for re-enlisting. A lot of hands. Very good. Okay, we're going to give something out here. I'm going to at least, uh, for the coin's sake, thank you, Chief. Where are you from, Chief? Uh, South Carolina, sir. South Carolina? Lancaster. South Carolina. Lancaster, very nice. Thank you, Chief. Where are you from? Yes, sir. Decatur, Georgia, sir. Decatur, Georgia. Folks, you may sit down if you like. Did you relax? Yes, sir. Where are you from, buddy? Carbondale, Illinois. Carbondale? Illinois. Very sir. nice. Where are you from? Analaska, Wisconsin, sir. Analyst? Analaska, Wisconsin. Analaska, okay. Where are you from, miss? Uh, Richmond, New Jersey. Bridgeton, New Jersey. Bridgeton, New Jersey. Is that up uh, near New York City? Uh, no, sir. Where's it near? South Jersey, near Camden. Oh, okay. Very good. You know where Cherry Hill is in, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Where are you from, buddy? Michigan, sir. Michigan. My wife's from Michigan. Where are you from, Michigan? The peninsula. Are you up in the peninsula? Uh, in the upper peninsula. Upper peninsula. Yeah. <laughs> hey, where are you from? Homosassa, Florida, sir. Whoops, I'm sorry. Where? Homosassa, Florida, sir. Homosassa, Florida. Homosassa, Florida. Sir. How about you, buddy? Where are you from? Columbus, Ohio. Columbus, Ohio, huh? Buckeye. Where are you from? Austin, Texas, sir. Austin, Texas. Nice city. Where are you from? Fairfax, Vermont. Fairfax, Vermont. Very nice. Good, sir. Hey, buddy, where are you from? Cottonwood, Arizona. Cottonwood? Yes, sir. Nice to see you. Where are you from, buddy? New York City. New York City? Yes, sir. What's going on with the Yankees? Yes, sir. Yankee. What do you mean, yes, sir? They're not doing all that good. What are you talking about? It's fine, sir. Still the best team in baseball. <laughs> okay. You betcha. Okay, what else we got? Okay. Chief of Naval Operations will now award Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medals. Okay, we got certificates or anything I give? Right. Okay. Bring the uh, awardees up here, sir. Fall out. Okay. The there we go. She's going to look over there. Congratulations. Thank Way you. to go. Where are you from? There you go. Congratulations. Congratulations. There you go. Skills, By the way, we're still talking about you, aren't we? <laughs> as the administrative and operational leading petty officer during current manning shortfalls. Her flawless management of all administrative and command programs were critical in the accomplishment of the LSO school mission. Petty officer Gates' exceptional professionalism and selfless devotion to duty reflected credit upon her and were in keeping with the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. All right, Petty Officer Gates. Give me a high five, everybody. Uh, you have family here? No, my family is my command. Okay, very, I like that. That's very good. From the Department of the Navy, this is to certify the Secretary of the Navy has awarded the Navy Marine Corps Achievement Medal, Gold Star, and Did you get the picture already? To air traffic controller, first class, air warfare, surface warfare, Richard okay. D. Morton. 
United States Navy for professional achievement in the superior performance of his duties as an air traffic she controller, got your while assigned to Fleet Area Control and Surveillance Facility, Virginia Capes, from February to June 2013. Officer Morton assisted in the establishment of the Air Traffic Control Facilities Assured Personnel Qualification Standards, lauded by the Commander, Naval Air Force Atlantic, as a model of fleet efficiency. His training program streamlined the training and qualification process for 29 naval air stations and four fleet area control and surveillance facilities. Pay Officer Morton's exceptional professionalism and selfless devotion to duty reflected credit upon him and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. There you go. <laughs> okay, we're caught up. All right, we're all caught up now. Hit it. Chief Naval Operations <laughs> will now award enlisted information dominance warfare pen. No law Congratulations. Yeah. that IT3 Stephen R. Jones, having attained significant you grow? experience in information York. dominance. Oh, Brooklyn, New York. Yes, had a guy from New York over there. Do you know that guy? In New York, we're going to stay together. While serving at Navy Cyber Defense Operations Command, has qualified as an enlisted information dominance warfare specialist. Okay, we'll try again. You can sit down. Why do I have this one? Yeah, that's for the uh, new speed for the, the uh, internet server. Ah, uh, okay. All right, please have a seat, everybody. Danielle, can I have the pointer? Well, first of all, happy Independence Day here coming up. Everybody be safe, get together with your family, have a good time. Do what you can. Don't burn down the house. Be, uh, you know, don't burn yourself and all that stuff. Do the right thing. Uh, number two, I don't know if you knew that, but this week is the 40th anniversary of the all-volunteer force. It's been that long we've had an all-volunteer force. And some of you, I don't think anybody here is as old as I am, even my wife's not as old as I am, uh, remember when that got started. But make no mistake about it. You know what makes us the greatest military in the world and the finest and most powerful Navy in the world is the all-volunteer force. You are. And no matter how high-tech we are, no matter how much money, how much of this, that, or the other thing, our asymmetric advantage, and always has been, are people, you, that are willing, and the families who support you, who are willing to join uh, up and stay with us. What I'd like to do today, I'm here to, with Darlene to listen and to learn. So I really want to know what's on your mind today. So you've got to give it to me so I understand what's on your mind so we can take things back. And I have a few guys here, some... Uh, my, uh, my documenter here, Brian, he's up front here. He's got the blue shirt and the tie. If you ask me a question, I don't know, he may run over there and get your name, and we'll get back to you. But also, he's copying things down for us to take back. I don't remember any names. I do mostly policy. So don't worry about any of that, about your, uh, if you've got an individual issue. But I want to talk about a few things to kick it off today. Uh, and right away, we're going to talk about sexual assault. I need to tell you, we need to understand, you and I, collectively, that this is a problem for our times. This is not going to go away until we beat it. This is not going to be fixed by stand downs. We did a stand down out of, out of the need and the purpose as, as defined by the Secretary of Defense to take, take some time and stop and think about this. We took the time to look and make sure that in our spaces, I mean, do we have, the, do we have a right atmosphere there? And just kind of, it's just a point in time, the fact that we did that. But the way we're going to get to this and get it resolved is when you all, because we're all responsible, decide you've had enough of it. So you all, anybody of you who are in this Navy, have to collectively decide that you're not going to put up with it anymore and we're going to get to it. If you are a work center supervisor, and certainly if you're a chief petty officer, I know the master chief petty officer of the Navy has communicated with you and asked you to start talking about this and sorting this out and talk to your people about it. If you're in the command triad, the command master chief, or you're in command, or you're the executive officer, you know that you're responsible for the climate and the environment that you have to make your people grow in that area. 
that I hold you responsible and I'll hold you accountable for that area. So we have to understand the environment and make sure we have a proper environment for our people to work in. Because our people deserve a safe environment so that they can thrive, not just figure out how to survive. The concept of a shipmate assaulting another shipmate is, is just unacceptable. So we need to get after this thing. There are a lot of things coming up. We'll try to do this as deliberate as possible. When I say coming up, tools that we will provide to continue to do this. Now I tell you, in the next couple of weeks, you'll see some material coming out, words, from headquarters. One, if you're in command, you're going to see a message that's going to come out and describe, just to be clear, what we mean by the climate that we want you to set. It's not new. It's a climate free of harassment, uh, hazing, as well as sexual harassment. It's a climate where people can grow in, where we have dignity and respect for each other. And number two, uh, there'll be a message come out which will kind of lay out, it'll be a, a few weeks, it'll lay out uh, organizational changes that we'll have at headquarters. You'll see that we're devoting, I have a, a, a flag officer reporting to me, particularly for to keep moving ahead in the things we need to do in sexual assault and understand this issue, understand the problem as we move ahead. There'll be sexual assault prevention and response coordinators specifically detailed <clears throat> to all of the... Uh, our community leaders and our Navy component commanders, that's like Fleet Forces, Compact Fleet, uh, Surf Lance, Surf PAC, I'm sorry, Surf PAC, uh, Surf 4, et cetera, the, the uh, Cybercom, Fleet Cybercom, uh, commands of that nature. You'll see that <clears throat> some of the pilots that we have successfully run at Great Lakes and the attributes of those pilots at Great Lakes in San Diego, and we're going to expand them overseas, we're finding that they have great utility and they've had great success we're going to extend those around the fleet. And that will include improvement in, in barracks, uh, inspections. I don't mean going into rooms and inspecting, but just the security and the environment around it where we're finding improved, improved security, lighting, things of that nature, a whole host of things where we're just going to get involved a little bit more uh, in the welfare of our folks and making sure things are going well in that regard. So you'll see this laid out uh, in addition to some means that we want to be able to track this problem so that we can understand it, so that we can turn it around. It includes uh, assistance for uh, victims. It includes simpler ways and multitude of ways to report a sexual assault or something that, or sexual harassment for that regard. And there are like nine ways right now, and only one of them involves the chain of command. So it's about making sure that we have the tools out there and the means to get this done. We gotta get after this. It's going to be, it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to be long term. We've had challenges similar to this in the past, the drugs of the 70s and the 80s, and it takes a, a hard, long commitment. There's no year analysis that just makes it so simple to determine this. It's, it's complicated, and we need to be able to trust each other and get after it. So that's, this is a challenge of our times. Next, I want to talk a little bit about and just kind of reassure you what our mandate is. Can I have the, the first picture up there? This is a description, uh, just kind of a lay down of where your Navy is around the world today. You'll see there's in the lower right, your right, 99 ships out there. About six months ago, that was up to 105, and it has been above 100 for some time. So this 99 is a reflection of this challenge we've had in funding. Uh, recently, that I'm sure you've read about and many of you are living through. But we remain about half of, of your fleet, what we provide out there, is in the Asia Pacific and about a third are out in the Arabian Gulf. Everywhere you see that non-rotational, those are forward deployed or forward stationed ships. They're there all the time. Uh, they either rotate the crew, they rotate civilian mariners, or the crew lives there in the country, such as in Japan and such as what will take place in Rota, Spain here when four destroyers move out there. And my point to you is, as we work through our budget challenges this year, next year, and through this next, this next period of the decade, it is going to be about making sure that we are where it matters, when it matters. Our job is to provide forward presence out there to our combatant commanders, to our allies and partners, to reassure them so that we can respond. That's been the job of our Navy for forever since we've had a Navy, and it continues to be and will be our job in the, in the future. 
That is where we are at our best, when we are out and about in these places. So our job will be to get rotating forces there that are ready to get it done, and our job will also be to find innovative and proper ways to, to forward station as much as feasible uh, to get the job done. Okay, thank you very much. You can take that down if you want. So uh, our budget challenge, uh, we, when we were flying in here just a minute ago, I, was, I really loved the idea that there were jets lined up and people were training. Uh, but as you know, this has been a challenge. Uh, this year, we effectively, when we had a continuing resolution, which means we didn't have a budget and we were operating on 12's funds, which is not enough, then we got a budget somewhere around the April time frame and things picked up. We were able to recover a lot of operations, but not enough. Today, of all those ships you see there, what you have is you've got one carrier strike group in the Gulf, one carrier strike group in the Pacific, one amphibious ready group in the Gulf, one amphibious ready group in the Pacific. And right now we have one carrier strike group surge, ready to go, can get underway pretty quickly, and the same with an amphibious ready group. But it's the surge is where we're lower than we have been. We usually have three of each instead of one of each. And I know that some of you who fly or who support flying, uh, when you come, you've come back from deployment, we're standing down air wings because we don't have enough operating money to keep them flying at a level that I think is appropriate and that I would prefer to. And we're saving that money, making sure that we fund the next to deploy and those that are certifying to get ready to deploy and those that are on deployment. Therefore, that picture up there that showed uh, where we are. As we go into 14 right now, we're preparing for the fact that we could be into a continued resolution and sequestration again. But we have, the, we have the time to prepare for this. We have time to lay out the budget and the fact that it will be a frugal year and, the, and, and where we can put the money to get the most return uh, from that investment. I would tell you that manpower will be, uh, our approach will be that manpower will be set aside. In other words, we're not gonna, we're not gonna reduce people uh, if you will, military person, take them out. It would not be my intention to request any furlough uh, as part of our 14 budget. You know the story on the 13 budget on furloughs, but it, it was in the Navy, we don't intend to request that. That's done department-wide, so that debate will take place depending on the size of that 14 budget, which is right now up on the hill in a request. But uh, our 14 year will look about that same. One carrier forward deployed in the Pacific, one carrier four deployed in the Gulf, and about one amphibious ready group each place, and one ready to go set up, uh, to surge, if you will. Uh, what I'd like to do, and what we'll strive to do, is to ensure we have more money in the training piece, the inner, uh, the, the fleet response plan, the pre-deployment piece, not just the workup, but folks when they come back. I don't want to go to tactical hard deck. I don't want to go to shutdown. And we've got to figure out what is the right level and what is the right level of funding, what is the right level of flying, and what is the right level of funding. And the same goes for steaming, and the same goes if you're Navy Expeditionary Combat Command and any of the other uh, supporting forces. So uh, first, uh, before we go to questions, I'd like to welcome our online folks and uh, who may be sending in questions and uh, may have some issues they want to talk about. But let's open the floor up now. I've got just over a half an hour. We'll get a good bit of questions. Uh, to talk about things that you all want to talk about. So they go to the mic or I can repeat the question as well. Okay. <clears throat> all right. What is the future of the Blue Angels flight demonstration team? The future of the Blue Angels flight demonstration team, in my view, is we're going to have a Blue Angels flight demonstration team. Due to uh, funding this year, we were unable to, to do the shows that they wanted to do. But uh, we're looking at next year right now, what is the right level uh, for, the again, the, the appropriate distribution of funding. Uh, but right now, uh, I view them as a valuable commodity. Good morning. Steve. Good morning. Hey, I was just glad to see it. Uh, I was wondering, uh, with regards to the nav base plan of 2013 through 2017, we can expect more float forward staging base deployments in the future. Will these builds be built by the typical orders uh, selection process or more of a uh, high volume process? The float forward staging base, uh, first of all, that's, 
What that is is a, a ship built in San Diego that will... Uh, are, you, are you talking about the Ponce, the one that's over there in the Gulf, or the new one? Either one. Either one, okay. Well, both of them. The, the, we did the Ponce, which came from Norfolk, and she was a LPD that was going to go into retirement, and we manned her with military sea lift command folks, and we asked for volunteers because we turned this around so quickly, the deployment. And by the way, the Ponce is doing a great job over there as an afloat forward staging base. A tremendous force multiplier and uh, does an amazing job supporting mine countermeasure ops, uh, maritime uh, interdiction operations, and special forces. Uh, we are going to keep her there till about 16, where she'll be replaced with a production of Float Forward Staging Base, much larger, built in San Diego, uh, with uh, what will look like, kind of look like a tanker with a large, uh, with a with a uh, flight deck on it. But uh, it'll be extraordinary, extraordinarily big. We'll use uh, due course folks, if you will. It won't be. It's not an IA concept. That was a one-time concept because uh, we wanted to turn the Ponce so quickly. Thank you, You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. uh, CNO, I think this, is a, this new platform is interesting. Could you take a moment to explain it to those that might not understand? All right. What is this new platform? Brian, put a picture of it up there. I'm going to show you what the afloat forward staging base is. A while back, we went to a shipbuilder in San Diego. Uh, it's called NASCO, and they built our TAKE. These are auxiliary dry store ships that you've seen, a few of them down there, if you're at Naval, uh, Naval Base uh, Norfolk there. And we said, hey, could you build something like this? Uh, now back up one. Yeah. This thing is what they at first built, and what this is is a tanker. And you take the centerpiece of that tanker, and you, put, you use it to ballast up and down. And so... This part right here, this ship bounces up and down, and you float things on and off this. Back up one more. That's what it looks like when it's out at sea, ballasted down. So you bring an air cushion vessel, auxiliary ships on there, and then you ballast it up. Go ahead and move forward. And it looks like that. Now, if we said, okay, this is huge, could you put a flight deck on this? So you go to the next one, they said, sure. We could do that for $100 million. And they did. This is as big as an amphibious uh, big deck, like you see here, and uh, in that it's about 800, 900 feet. And this deck size is about the size of that which we have in an amphibious big deck. You can see it has helos, it has drone capability, and it will actually be built to take an F-35B, that is a Joint Strike Fighter. Uh, this is a command and control space. You can also put fleet hospital in here. You've got to bring it in, and you can do repairs down in here. So that's the forward, float forward staging base that we're talking about. That's what that looks like. Okay, next question. Thank you. Thanks for your time, sir. It's in kind of old GF81. Uh, with all the funding and budget problems we have right now, and uh, trying to sort through uh, in the Congress, possibly reviewing the BRAC. Um, how committed are you or the Navy to keeping any associated? Oh, we're very committed. We, uh, we the Department of Defense, uh, asked for a BRAC. That means Base Realignment and Closing, which is a study to see, to, to resize, if you will, the, the number of bases we have out there. In the Navy, we had no overdriving uh, situation. We had tremendous amount of excess infrastructure or bases that we just said, look, this is just, we're carrying this too much. We have more shore facility, more tail, if you will, uh, than we need. But it's, it's distributed around, and we can probably work that a little bit outside of BRAC. We're very committed to NAS Oceana, uh, NAF, uh, NAS, Naval Air Station, excuse me, it's not a facility. Uh, it's bigger. Uh, we're here. Uh, it's a master jet base, and uh, we're going to be here for the future. I mean, we got amazing support from this area. It's the right fit. You're welcome. I'm sorry, especially, what was your civil last? Affairs, civil Affairs. Yeah, the Civil Affairs uh, group, uh, Maritime Civil Affairs 
support team, I think MCAST is what uh, it's called, they have uh, a fairly unique capability in that they go out and can intermingle and train with a lot of foreign navies, a lot of get into foreign countries, reside, get in there, they understand culture, and they've been very effective and the co combatant commanders are almost addicted to it. As we get into the future, the way we're going to approach Expeditionary Combat Command and all that they have are what are the capabilities that we really need so that we don't summarily get rid of the capability and then we, it's very difficult to reconstitute and you can't size it. So it's about how much capacity do we need for the number of capabilities. We're looking at that. No decision has been made. It will be a, a fiscal year 15 budget decision and we're doing that review now. Uh, I would like to keep as much capability as possible, especially if it's something unique that we've built over the last decade of, of a lot of uh, conflict over in the Mideast, where we've learned quite a bit uh, on how to assist uh, other nations to, to build, in, in particular, their militaries and, and what's relevant for them and what resonates with them. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good morning, CNO. Good morning. My name is uh, Andy Gino. I've done back-to-back uh, -back deployments, earned a couple of EVs along the way, also met a lot of great people. Um, one thing I've noticed being in the Navy is we have a lot of undesignated people and people that like to cross street, and the opportunity just doesn't exist. So we're losing a lot of great people that benefit from the Navy and also the people around them. What is it that the Navy is going to do to re retain these people or allow these people to cross rate and to other rates well, um, I think if I go to the chief of naval personnel, he might say, well, I don't agree with that. I think we've got a lot of opportunity. In fact, I depend quite a bit on people joining and then, and then, uh, then if you will, striking for a raid very quickly in there once we get them to sea. We are growing the Navy right now. In fact, in this year, in this fiscal year 13, where we don't have enough money, as I described before, before to do a lot of things, we're going to grow 4,000 people in the Navy. Uh, we will be at 322,000 here. At, uh, in fact, we were at the end of June. So I take your comment back and see, okay, what is it? What are those valves? What are those adjustments that we can make, allow people to cross rate, number one? Because when we talked about the former PTS, the idea was to be able to uh, allow people to cross rate so that they could reenlist but also those that, uh, that join unrated for them to quickly get, uh, strike, if you will. So I'll take that back uh, and look at it, but the fact of the matter is we do have to get that right because we're continuing to grow, to size ourselves to the fleet, which is growing uh, and will be over the next few years. Regardless of sequestration and all that, these ships, we have 47 ships under contract right now, and they're being built, and they're going to come out pretty quickly, especially a little combat ship. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Steve. Good morning, Sienna. Good morning. Zarga from FRC Oceana. My question in regards to sequestration and retention. With Manning on the decline, what, if anything, is in the works for bringing in and retaining talented sailors? Okay. Well, as I just sort of alluded to, Manning is uh, not on the decline, however, uh, overall. However, I will tell you, we have got to match the skill set in the NEC with what is needed, particularly at sea and on our flight lines. So we are filling the Navy pretty well, actually, but we are not, we need to do better to fit where people need to go. Again, the, the right seniority with the right rating, with the right Navy enlisted classification code to match those skill sets. Uh, we are working on that, I, I'd say very hard, if you will. We are improving. We've got a, a definite improvement in uh, gaps at sea. Uh, we've been working on that through the year. It's been a very, very high priority item, but uh, first step is getting the people in and then getting the distribution right. So we're, we're about there getting the people in. Now we've got to work hard on the distribution, looking at shore billets versus sea billets and making sure we're prioritizing them right. You, it's underway. Good morning, CNO. Good morning. I have a question about um, the State 21 program. Yes. A lot of sailors that have a goal of becoming an officer, and recently there's been a cancellation on, on a lot of programs um, from uh, State 21. Um, I just want to know how does that compare to the new officers that the Navy's getting from universities, and what could we look forward to? 
Okay. We get about uh, ballpark numbers. 800 from the Naval Academy, 800 from NROTC, um, about 1,300, I think, from um, OCS, and we get about 200 from the Seaman to Admiral Stay 21 program. So I need that program, and I need that input, and uh, for the reasons I just stated, we are growing. Uh, I don't know about a reduction. Uh, it is my understanding that that program stays the same or may be in, you know, proportionally, in order to maintain the right officer level, may have to go up a bump. I'll take your question back and make sure that uh, if there's a reduction, I, I don't understand why. They would have to have a, you know, an equivalent increase in the other programs. But State 21 has served us very well, and it provides us a talent pool uh, that we can't get anywhere else. You know, folks like maybe yourself interested coming up uh, from the list of ranks, and that's a skill set we definitely need. So let me go, I need to go back and take a look at that, and I will. Yeah. You're welcome. Yes? Good morning, sir. I've got a question from the internet from a Navy civilian. How likely do you think it will, will be that we will face another round of furloughs next fiscal year? Well, it's difficult for me to say how likely it is, because that implies I put a number on it, and that's hard. I would tell you this, that, that in the Navy, uh, we don't want to do that. We didn't want to do it, but uh, nobody wanted to do furloughs in FY13, uh, but that's not our plan in 14. Uh, we have the time to plan our budget. Uh, as opposed to FY13 when we didn't have as much time. We couldn't even get started until January, and then we got a bill in March, so it was very difficult. Here we have the time, and it's, it would not be our plan to do furloughs in fiscal year 14, uh, but I can't say we won't. I'll just say that th that's not our approach. Yes, miss. Okay. Uh, I'm not familiar. Closed loop detailing to me, as I'd, I'd have to study the concept, means that uh, you stay within, if in aviation, I suppose, your type model series. So if you're a mechanic for a uh, Prowler Growler or for a Hornet, you, you would stay there. Uh, what I know we are doing in the interest of a couple of questions I had, hey, what about gaps uh, that we as a priority, ensure that squadrons, float squadrons, and deploying squadrons are properly filled. So it might be a priority, but once those are filled, we would then tend to open them, those, those jobs up, or those billet opportunities to others, as opposed to just automatically closed looping and constraining it. So it might be a priority detail, but not necessarily a, a closed loop. In other words, you fill that first. The, uh, with regard to advancement opportunities, uh, what I'm being told is that that nurture or that that's going to give you that sailor that much more skill set, and and should actually enhance their promotion opportunities in that particular skill. You know, the, if if it involves maintenance, say for uh, for certain aircraft. You're welcome. Yes, go ahead. Okay, well, let me answer. The alcohol detection device, I'm glad you didn't say breathalyzer because it isn't a breathalyzer. A breathalyzer is actually a legal device that you can use the result for to, uh, to take uh, disciplinary action or legal action. An alcohol detection device uh, is not that, and it can't be used as such. No, there will be no percentages. Uh, I have no plans, and I've directed that, that we not turn this into a program run from headquarters. Uh, what it is designed to be is a tool, among other tools, so that our commanding officers and our leadership teams can determine and understand what is the alcohol use among those and have our people understand what the alcohol use is they have uh, and is there an abuse. So it's meant to be an educational device and an assessment tool from within the command. It can be used by the, by the skipper as he or she determines up to a certain point where you can't take administrative or disciplinary action based on the outcome of that alone. 
Uh, so we're, we're just now getting that thing going. We'll tweak it here or there. But uh, I thought it was a good idea. The Secretary of the Navy uh, put it into the, the uh, 21st century sailor so that we could understand uh, what our alcohol use is in the Navy. We think and we hear and we listen and sometimes we observe uh, alcohol use as a, as a problem, but we say, but what is it? How do we figure it out and how do we understand it? And that's what this is designed to help us be able to do. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Good morning. Here we go. With sequestration being such a big issue right now, how would that affect future deployments as far as how long they would be and how fast we would have to turn around and do another deployment? Well, sequestration, uh, as it compresses operations, tends to limit deployments from that regard. Uh, as I was mentioning in my opening remarks, right now we can sustain under a sequestered budget, if you will, in other words, a limited budget due to the operations funding reductions, one carrier strike group forward and one is in surge. And as we work through the fleet response plan, that's, that's the requisite number that would work up. In the near term, we had some situations where uh, we had a carrier uh, casualty on, on one, a material casualty, and the carrier coming out of maintenance wasn't ready, and that extended the deployment of one carrier. Uh, another case occurred where the Eisenhower, who returns today, actually went on deployment, came back for a period, and then went back out on deployment. So she'll be returning from a five-month deployment. So what, what you should see over the next, say, year is uh, Nimitz will finish her deployment in about six months. And then the follow-on deployer, the Truman, is going to be close. She'll be around eight months. The one after that will be about eight months. Uh, and the one after that is that now you're at the end of 14, and it's very difficult for me to predict. Uh, at, it is about that time, as we move into fiscal year 15, as we sit down in the service and lay down the budget, uh, my intention is to provide the, the right maintenance, the manning, as we talked about before, the right fit, uh, so that we can get a more predictable deployment uh, approach. So the, actually, the sequestration tends to constrain the, the turnaround, you know, because we don't have the operational money, unless there's a contingency. The world always gets a vote. I think you understand that. Uh, and so it will tend to limit deployments. But right now you're looking at uh, eight-month deployments, eight-month plus for 14, for the, the two carrier strike groups going in 14. Sir. You're welcome. Yes? Sir, good morning, sir. Marine Corps will adopt all of the legacies. Oh, Hornets. Um, I'm not familiar with that, that. That We have not determined as a result of sequestration or any future of aviation as we look 15 on out uh, what the department's TAC air is. We'll go into that this summer and sort that out based upon you know, how many Joint Strike Fighters are bought uh, versus how many Super Hornets we have versus our need and the, and the makeup of the air wing. Uh, and the uh, and the UDP plan, the uh, what is that under deployment plan? Anyway, the the UDP plan for for the Marine Corps. We have to sort that out this summer. You're welcome. Good morning, sir. Manager Chan. Okay. Uh, is there any truth, or uniforms might be changing again? <laughs> Well, uh, if you, you know there's a, a proposed amendment to require a uh, joint uniform, or at least for a study of that. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, but when you say change, uh, I would like, I'm, I'm interested in quality. As you know, the MCPON is interested in making sure we wear the uniforms that we have correctly. And he's put that out. There's a video out on it very clearly, a NAV admin. Uh, so I encourage you to see the video. Uh, I've asked uh, to look at quality. I get a lot of reports that, that uh, the Navy working uh, uniform is hot and hard to wear, especially in the tropical areas. So I'd say, OK, look at that. Is there something feasible to go to that? And I'm also always interested in the fit. Uh, so fit and quality materials where I am. Changing the uniform itself is not where I am right now. OK. Good morning, CNL. 
and see what match they have pay 81. Um, my question is in regards to all the budget constraints. Uh, I know our squadron for one is here at Oceana. We're attached to the Carl Vincent and our airway is actually out in the moor. Uh, I know that's a verse, vice versa type thing going on as well. The squadron is out the west coast and attached to ships here. Uh, it, it would seem that that would be something that might be addressed uh, financial constraint wise because all the money it costs to ship us back to the time. Is that something in the plan to Well, it's something we look at uh, as we pull. Uh, the squadrons, and actually this is managed by tail number, uh, to form the squadrons, to form the air wing, and where they're going to, you know, how they come together and then in and in get connected, if you will, to the carrier. Uh, but we look at that and we try to be as efficient as possible. When we send the, the tails into, uh, to depot, uh, where are they going to come out, when are they going to come out, and when they come out, where do we send them? Recognizing as much as possible in the master aviation air plan where they're going, you know, where, when and where they need to be to deploy. So the answer to your question is yes, we look at it. Uh, will we look at it closer in the future? Absolutely yes, because that is an added cost for PCS, uh, for movement of aircraft, it's fuel, it's, it's all of those things. Uh, and we also look at it for how many, uh, to, to the Marines' previous question, how many aircraft do we need and uh, you know, the size of the air wing in that. All those things we'll, we'll look at very hard this summer, the remainder of this summer and fall. Okay, sir. Good morning, sir. My name is Aaron Payne from VFA 34. And uh, I was just wondering, again, with uh, the financial situation that the Navy is in, is there anything as a junior enlisted personnel that myself or any of the others uh, will need to be aware of, such as uh, changes and benefits or anything like that uh, for us just coming in, or uh, like opportunities for advancement, reenlistment, things of that sort? Well, uh, I'll talk to retirement first because that tends to be your legacy. There is no plan on the books right now to change your retirement. So when you joined up and the fact that you wear a uniform and all, everybody that does, the retirement plan remains the same. And it will be grandfathered. The president himself has said that. But there is a commission that is looking at retirement and what might be opportunities for future folks that come in. There are a lot of people that feel, hey, I'd prefer a 401k. I'd prefer something where I come in and I'll contribute to it and maybe the federal government will contribute to it. And then when I d depart the service, no matter when it is, I'll take it with me, whatever I contributed, and, and move on from that. Others want a deferred retirement, which is what you've effectively signed up to. With regard to advancement and populating, we, the, our personnel are aligned very much to the ships and the aircraft that we have. So the way we would change the size of the Navy, people-wise, that's connect, directly connected to force structure. Uh, so I need you to advance, and I need you to, to move up in your skill set. I need you, as I mentioned, you are part of this all-volunteer force that makes us great to continue to advance, uh, con, you know, commensurate with the size of the Navy and the, the, the technical changes, which again, we're growing with new ships. So put another way, uh, for, as far as advancement, I don't see a change in that regard. As far as compensation, entitlements, uh, and that kind of business, we'll look at all of those because it is quite expensive. Uh, today, uh, it costs just personnel alone are one half of, the, of our DOD budget uh, for people. If uh, we keep growing at the rate we're growing on entitlements, and this includes health care and a whole host of things that, that we have to put in, uh, that, that's going to get out to 70 or 80 percent of our budget when you get into the, the low, you know, 2022, 2023. That's extraordinary, and we need to look at this very deliberately, and so we will. But we'll look at it closely because, again, we can't undermine the all-volunteer force and that which uh, get, makes you stay and makes you do the things you want to do. Thank you, sir. Yes, miss. Yes, uh, I don't have, a, I don't see a riff, uh, if you will. The riffs are not done force-wide, and that there's no plan to do that. They are done by activity level. 
So that's, I can't speak, I'm unfamiliar with, you know, MCAS and, and where they are. Uh, but I would tell you, the, we will continue to look, we as department-wide, at how are obligations going? In other words, the money that we have, are we spending it where we wanted to and where we said we could? Are we obligating it right? Because as soon as we furlough people, many times the people that write the contracts that enable us to obligate, if they're not at work because they're furloughed, then you know, we will, will that money be available over the remainder of the year? So we'll look very closely week by week to see if there is that opportunity to, uh, to reduce furloughs. And that's being done department-wide. I tell you, that's, they're looking at that very hard. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Um, the the last thing you said with a affected with uh, expected to be affected will they increase decline or remain the same with regards to the uh, reshaping of the rating manual? I think they'll remain the same. I'd look at that very closely, but we have no chain no op, no intention to make any dramatic changes to the rating levels. Uh, I keep your eye on the fact as we as we bring new ship types in, you know there'll be certain skill sets that will alter as we need more of those. Uh, and look at retirements because there's a commensurate retirement for the ships we bring in. Morning, CNO. We're going to do deep on JCP2. I've heard a lot of sailors talk about lost man hours for separate stand down training, and I was just wondering do you think that uh, going through two hours of training is an effective first step toward changing sailors and deterring would be sexual assailants? Well, it is if it's done properly because this is, and this is the thing I spend more time on, and uh, Lieutenant, we got to get this right. Uh, this was a directed um, uh, initiative, if you will, the stand down, uh, and so we're going to do it. And my view is let's do it right and make it effective uh, and then move on from there and think about this closely. Good morning, oh, good morning. Good morning, Steve. All right, so uh, I'll talk to presence and then maybe the, the territorial disputes. Uh, if I were to put another chart up there which showed you the Western Pacific, you know, it had 53 ships in the Western Pacific. Based on the current ship inventory that we plan, based on the current shipbuilding plan, with the budget that we have right now, uh, we'll, we'll have about 62 ships out there in the Western Pacific by 2020. And that's a function of little combat ships coming in, joint high-speed vessels, the afloat forward staging base joining us. Uh, the literal combat ship, we have one down in Singapore. The Freedom is down there now on a deployment. We'll eventually have four down there, uh, forward stationed there. So that will increase. So our presence in ships alone, the Joint Strike Fighter will deploy to the Western Pacific first. We've got broad area maritime surveillance, which is a, a Global Hawk UAV. Uh, with marinized sensors on it, operating out of Guam by the end of the decade. And we'll have the P-8, which is a 737-800 tricked out with a, a bunch of uh, new sensors. Very, very effective aircraft that's doing great. So presence will go up there, uh, and, and as well as our capability in the Western Pacific. With regard to the disputes, it's hard to predict. But I was there a month ago, that is the Western Pacific, down in Singapore, talking to the head of the Chinese, uh, excuse me, the head of the Japanese Navy, the South Sea Fleet commander, which is their biggest fleet. He was there in all the Southeast Asia countries. So there was a commitment to sit down and say, look, we have got to figure out when ships pass in the night or pass in the day, what is going to be the means by which we converse so that we don't, we can't like not converse because then you don't know what their intention is and that, that risks miscalculation. What are the protocols that we will use collectively? And that's called a code of conduct, and some call it uh, 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 unintended uh, interaction, and so it has a cues, a cues actually is the, but it's, it's really what do you say when you see somebody for the first time and how will we conduct ourselves. So there's, there's great uh, pressure on all countries to sign up. Everybody's in except for China right now, and they're looking at it and saying, well, 
I think, you know, I need freedom. I think you're putting me in a box. That's kind of what they're saying. And uh, the feeling down there, and this is among the ASEAN, the, the Asia countries there, and they're saying, you guys need to think about this, and we need to know what, what you feel. If you're in, tell us what words you want in this agreement. What do you believe the code of conduct need to be? Because uh, we're all signed up except for you. So there's a lot of, of um, intention right there in Southeast Asia. It's not just us. We believe uh, this needs to get done you know, country by country. If there's a bilateral issue, they need to sit down and describe this uh, and figure this out diplomatically and prevent miscalculation. Thank you. Good morning again, CNO. Good morning. PR1 coming to PR56. Uh, you continue to mention the, uh, the opportunities and growth of our Navy force. How much of that growth will be, uh, come to the actual FTS and reserve components? The, uh, the, actually, the reserve component will, will dip below 60,000 and come up, and I say dip below, I'm talking about the 15 time frame sit around 59 and then come back up to around uh, 60,000. But we're looking at a lot of opportunities, so this could grow some. I, I can't tell you. We're looking at our mission modules for the literal combat ship. We're looking at who, would, who will operate those because we'll need operators and managers for those sensors, uh, for the unmanned systems, the unmanned aerial systems. I mentioned uh, BAM's Broad Area Maritime Surveillance, the Global Hawk Up. The, that is a pretty good... Uh, system that might resonate with uh, managers, if you will, unmanned aerial vehicle managers and sensor managers uh, for that. And there are others that look like these could be uh, skill sets that reservists could kind of fit in very nicely, uh, where there's a nice rotation to it uh, and a relevant job. So there's opportunities starting to percolate out there. So I can't tell you specifically a number, but I can tell you there's opportunities there. Thank you. Sure. Morning, Cito. Once again, welcome to the NASO channel. Thank I'm you. My question is, on regards, on regards to the FTS side of the house, while on active duty, a lot of the rates have been, you know, the advancement opportunities have been widely opened up. On the FTS side, there's a lot of rates that's still like 0%. And so on, it's pretty hard for a lot of, you know, our guys on the FTS side to stay motivated and, you know, to want to keep doing what we're doing to, um, to support the Navy. I just mentioned a couple of those uh, positions, uh, skill sets uh, in unmanned. If uh, when they open up, and some of them will, uh, as you look across FTS and you look at the NECs and you look at the ratings, what Admiral Braun wants to do is she wants to balance that because she has shortages in one. So we need people to be willing to cross-rate, people to be willing to move over into another one. Uh, if they stay within their rating uh, and it's over man, it's difficult to move up, and it tends to stagnate promotions. So what we need to do is get a balance here. And if there are opportunities, like I said before, to go into other areas, we need people to be willing to do that. That will help open things up. Yes, uh, we discourage it. Uh, we stop that opening in that regard. When it, we've, we've agreed to look at, and we do this in the active as well, instead of one year ahead, let's say you want to, we're doing an advancement or a re-enlistment, somebody wants to re-enlist, instead of looking one year ahead, we'll look three years ahead and say, okay, is this a temporary overmanning situation as we look out for you know, uh, how many years in the Navy and an expected decline within that because people will retire because there's a bunch of them. And we'll look at that. And then we'll go ahead and approve perhaps a, a little bit of a higher promotion rate for a given year or we'll approve a reenlistment knowing that a couple of years from now we'll get relief. We didn't used to do that. We kind of limited that. So there are things like that. But it's a tweaker. Uh, you know, the, the way to get this done is to, is to look out there, listen, uh, get with your career counselor and see, okay, what, what other opportunities are there that may resonate with what I can do. Meanwhile, we will continue to look for those kinds of things in the future that a, an FTS sailor or a cell res can fit into. Thank you, sir. All right. See, you know, we have about five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Good morning, sir. I'm just wondering on the CV side of the house, uh, we've been decommissioning battalions left and right. We're still talking about decommissioning more battalions. And yet, our 
Our rates for every rate in the CD community is overmanned. However, on a daily basis, we feel like we're undermanned. We don't have enough people to do the task that's needed to come in CDs. So I'm wondering if there's any way of balancing that out. And the other thing is we had the ERB effect multiple uh, sailors within my community, you know, the, uh, six years and up, well, six to 14 years in, in that time frame, but it didn't really affect the upper chain of command as far as people that are, you know, chief and above, things like that. So that really locked up our advancement opportunities there. And now those spots are still filled and there's no advancement opportunity for the G5 and G6 level to move up. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if there's any way of well, there's there's ways to do a lot of what you said, and you you laid out a fairly broad plan. So, uh, are you active duty? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, as I mentioned before, my main man here, Brian, uh, he wrote that down. I need to go back and say, okay, what's the lay down here for CBs uh, now? Because what happens is when you when you re, uh, decommission anything. Uh, people don't just suddenly go away. They're, you know, they are ordered out. And so there'll be a period of time where you'll be sort of overmanned. And so that looks good because you say, hey, I got all these uh, skilled people, but where are they? Are they where they need to be in the other units? I need to go back and look at that, and I will. I, I, I'm not going to give you some flowing answer. I need to go study it. Thank you, sir. Okay. Good morning. My question is, with future um, budgets and review, well, I think you all know where I am at tuition assistance. We get great value from that. Um, uh, this will probably be managed DODY. Uh, I like tuition assistance. I think, like I said, we get good value. I think many of you know, because many of you grumbled, that we started dialing it down and said, hey, hey, we're going to limit the number. We want to know what you're going to study. We want you to graduate, no failing out, and then just go in and sign up for another. So we have some pretty good restrictions on ours, and I, I kind of like it. The Mick Pond and I talk about this a lot. So I'll be going in to say, I think it's a pretty good investment, but I think it may be a DOD-wide mandated, but you know where I am. Okay. Sir, I have a question from the internet. I'm concerned about the increasing number of suicides in the military. What is the Navy doing to address this issue? Okay, I am too. And uh, there's a, a small tidbit, usually it's always no good news, no good news. Uh, we have, a, in the last number of months, uh, what was a growing number of suicides through this year has really tapered off. So that's good for now. Uh, well, why is that, CNO? I don't know. I don't know. What I do know is this. We had, I had Admiral Carter, who is now, he just relieved as the president of the Naval War College. He spent about 60 to 70 days studying just suicide. Why do people do what they do? Uh, he came up with no perfect solution, but one thing he did come up with, and he formed what was called Task Force Resilience. And he said a resilient sailor, someone who knows how to handle stress, to han handle bad events, someone who can just handle themselves, and, and like I said, stress and all that goes with it, is, tends to be somebody who can recover, tends to not drift off into such distress that maybe sometime they'll take their life or think about that. So we're, we've put together, there were a lot of programs to make people more resilient, a lot of counseling available out there, a lot of different things here and there. I won't go through them all. He said, they're, they're all over the place. We need to pull them together and make sure that we've got them laid out there, and we need to continue to build on them, get rid of the duplicative ones and keep the good ones. So that's in progress right now. That's all part of that N17 code up at headquarters. Which, what you should see is you'll see more opportunities at Fleet Family Service Centers, folks coming down to commands and, and describing what folks need. And it's just not tailored for people to make it through the Navy. It's tailored to make you better able to be resilient through life. How do you deal with things through the, your entire life? Foreclosures, divorces, the, uh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. Life's tough, and so how do you get through it? And, I'd like all of you to feel better that you have enough tools to do that, to be more resilient, and your families. I got time for probably two more. So one, and then one more. Good yes, ma'am.
In what regard do you see this added value for our leaders? Okay. Well, I'm going very slowly on this. So before I describe it, it's pretty pricey. If you don't do it right, you don't get what you think, it could actually be the negative of what you think. 360 means you get a 360 view of yourself. What your, what your seniors think of you, what your subordinates think of you, what your peers, your professional peers think of you, and what people who are not your professional peers but they know you think of you. Measure it in certain attributes. So number one, you've got to pick the right people. Two, you've got to pick enough of them so you get a real, and this is one, two, three, and four, north, south, east, west, you got to get that right. They got to have enough time to fill out these questionnaires they're going to give them. And then they got to have enough time to write a decent summary. Somebody has to evaluate it. You see where this is going. Put it together right, and it needs to be consistent. So that the one that this individual gets is similar to the one to that, or uh, you get the point. So right now we're doing uh, some pilots on this. Um, these are known to be pretty good. Done properly, these are good. You say, gee, I didn't know I was like that. I thought I was one heck of a good guy. And they say, well, not everybody thinks that way. So, uh, and that's good. That's healthy because when you go through all of you, you know, enlisted or officer, when you grow up in your profession, no matter what it is, things change. You're more responsible. You control less day in and day out. Uh, and you're more responsible. So how do you manage that? Are you becoming an unhappy person all of a sudden? Uh, one that does not take criticism? That could be. That's the value of this, and we want to look at it because we would like to root people out that just don't do well, but we don't want to necessarily use that. And perhaps more importantly, we want people to understand how they change, particularly as they increase in responsibility. One more. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. I, I don't know. Uh, we are looking at that in, in the 14 budget uh, to do that. And the point is, uh, I'd like everybody to have a little skin in this game. Uh, and so let's say, well, if we're going to give you most of your tuition. You put a little bit in, there's some likelihood you're going to get pretty darn serious about this. Uh, but I'm not doing it just as a merely budget saving. Like I said, this is an investment. I need an, an educated force is a more confident force. Confident people will feel uh, better about themselves and they'll do bold things. And we need bold things here to come out here, thoughtful, bold things. Uh, so I, I think you all know where I am in tuition assistance. It's what's the right level. But again, the, you know, we, there's a fairness across Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, maybe even Coast Guard that we want to keep right. Okay? Let me uh, close by asking you to think hard about an opportunity to, if you want to make a change in the Navy, uh, then we want the RAD, okay, which is Reduction in Admin Distractions. Uh, we had a destroyer, you know, turn left and get hit by a tanker and almost lost the ship, came very close. We had a couple of submarine accidents. We've had some plane crashes. And as we looked at these over the last year or so, I was a little concerned that uh, as we looked in the investigation, what, what, were the, what was the command element and leadership doing? Well, in some cases, they were off doing admin when they should have been keeping the main thing the main thing. And I said, well, right, I would like a look. Who would like to do this? So Admiral Richardson said, why, I would. I did this, Admiral Richardson said, when he was submarine forces. So he's looking at this broadly. So I got him doing it, working with Admiral Shalansky, who some of you guys, gals may know. He was down here. And he's leading this up. They've laid out a website. It's out there published for you all to come in and say, let me tell you something, this is what I think. It's interactive, and I urge you to take this opportunity to get involved on stuff because uh, I want to get rid of the stuff that uh, doesn't help and return time and the right effort uh, there. And Admiral Richardson's leading us. So I offer that to you. Before I close, uh, once again, have a nice, safe weekend. To you families, as I see out here, thank you. Make no mistake, you are the wind underneath the sailor's wings. And for you civilians, uh, you are shipmates. You know, you are civilian sailors. Uh, I've, I've talked to furloughs and what I think about that. I stand before you because I was mentored and helped by a lot of Civ PERS, federal employees up in Washington, D.C. So all volunteer force, happy 40th anniversary, if you will. 
And remember, that's what makes you the finest Navy in the world. God bless you all. <laughs>